Materials provided by Tombow. I'm Professor Liu. I'm a fine artist working in drawing, printmaking, and sculpture. My parents immigrated from Taiwan to the United States in 1966. I was born and raised in the United States, so I'm a first-generation Asian American. This is my first trip to Taiwan, and I'm really excited to be visiting family, but I'll also be exploring Taiwan as an artist and getting to know my Tombow brush pens as I go. The thing about arriving in a foreign country is that it's really disorienting, no matter what foreign country you go to. And the thing is, I think drawing on site anywhere, even in a area that's familiar to you is already really challenging because you've got to deal with the weather, you have to make sure that you have a good place to draw, you got to bring all your supplies and everything. So drawing on site in a foreign country to me is so difficult because there's a billion factors that you have to deal with all the time. It took me a good four or five days before I really was able to figure out okay how am I going to do this because there were some times where we went to a site and I literally had only 10 minutes to sit down and make some work. Other times we really had a good half an hour. I had to figure out a system for how to handle all of these factors. I had to know that, okay, at any given moment, we'd have to get up and go. I'm traveling with my family. I've got my two kids, my husband, my mom, and my dad here. I think it's important when you're traveling and drawing at the same time that you put yourself in the right frame of mind. For example, if you set out and you're really trying to make super finished, polished, wonderful drawings, you're just gonna make yourself miserable. You're gonna end up torturing yourself. In fact, I found myself doing that last night. I was going through all my drawings, reviewing them, looking back at what I'd done so far now that I've been here for a week. And I started really critiquing myself. I started thinking, oh God, I don't want to show this one. This is so embarrassing. I don't want anybody to know that I made this crappy drawing. But then I thought, this is pointless because what am I gaining by bothering myself about not making better work? So I think given that the circumstances and logistics of traveling and drawing are so challenging, you just have to really accept the work for what it is and just move on. What's helped me is to just do a lot of drawings so that, for example, in one day, I might do three or four large drawings on the Bristol board, I might do three or four in the sketchbook, and then because I'm producing so much, at least I can hold on to that and not bother myself about the quality of the drawings. Another thing I really like about drawing and traveling is that it gets you really outside of your comfort zone because you end up drawing a lot of things you wouldn't normally draw. I'm somebody who really is engaged with drawing portraits most of the time. Portraits are what I love, they're what I really specialize in, and I do not think about myself as a landscape painter at all. I respect landscape painters and I think they do incredible things, but I don't have that inherent drive to paint or draw landscapes, which is why it's been such a pleasant surprise for me to make these landscape drawings with the Tombow brush pens because I'm not somebody who gets into foliage most of the time or water or landscapes or mountains. I found this little rusty pipe that had water coming down and there is this incredible layering of shrubs and bushes and trees and rocks and water. It was incredible the amount of depth and layering that was in there. I felt I guess I would say a little self-conscious about it because it was so outside of what I normally do, but I actually was pretty pleased with the results and I had a lot of fun playing with the marks and just seeing what the brush pens could do. Be okay doing what you're not good at because I think for me, most of the time, I'd much rather draw a face. I mean, this to me was so weird and strange. It was at the Taroko Lodge in Hualien. They had these um, Aboriginal stone carvings and I, I just love this ghoulish expression on this guy's face. So for me, a drawing like this is in my comfort zone. I feel very good doing something like this. It's totally indulgent. But then doing something like this, it's so refreshing. So take the leap and, and don't just seek out what you're good at. Sit down and do something that you're not good at and you might be pleasantly surprised. I've been in Taiwan for about a week now and already I've noticed that there's a major learning curve to my drawings. Part of it is that I'm getting to know the Tombow brush pens a lot better, but I also think that I'm starting to loosen up 
for example, one of the first sites that we saw was this temple. And I did this drawing of this metal looking guard. I mean, he looked really nasty and I loved his facial expression. And that was one of the first drawings that I did when I was here. And now that I look back at that drawing, it just feels really stiff to me. I can see that I'm not being as aggressive and as diverse with my marks in the brush pens. And then later on, when we went to the National Palace Museum, I did this drawing of this I don't know if he's a god or if he's a demon, but he's somebody you don't want to mess with. And I was excited about this drawing because I feel like this was a breakthrough where I started to trust the brush pen a little bit more. I feel like in the earlier drawings, I was definitely holding back. And the consequence is that the drawings were starting to look really stiff and the marks were very predictable and monotonous. And this one, I felt like I could really let go. I could be bolder. I could just throw down a huge swath of a really broad, wide, wide mark and be okay with that. I think the thing about the brush pens that's great is that they're super sensitive. And so even the slightest little bit of pressure will produce a mark and that's wonderful, but it's also really hard to control. And so what I found is that you have to learn to live with your marks. I think if you are even remotely worried about the marks that you're making and you can't really stand behind it, you're going to be in big trouble. So you really have to trust the pen to make the mark it wants to make and don't try to make the mark you want to make because inevitably it's not going to happen. The brush is going to do the mark that it wants to make, so you might as well just be along for the ride. Choosing what media to use when you're on the go traveling I think is a really important decision because there's definitely media that are just not convenient to work with. And I respect anybody who can paint on the road because it's just so much equipment to lug around. I think what's good to have is a few options, but also just to keep your equipment as lean as possible. What I give myself is two options for drawing on. So I have my small sketchbook, which I can whip out at any time, work super fast. And then I also have bristle board for when I have a little bit more time, I can create a more sustained drawing. It definitely took some time to do a little bit of research, figure out what surface was gonna work best because I had a regular run-of-the-mill sketchbook and it was a problem because the paper was so thin that the brush pens would just bleed through to the other side. This Strathmore soft cover sketchbook is a lot better because the paper is a lot thicker and I do like that it's a little bit textured. It's not super rough, but it's pretty durable, but it absorbs the brush pen so differently than the Bristol board. The Bristol board that I'm working on is really extremely smooth. It doesn't really absorb the brush pen. The brush pen just sort of glides across the surface. I've worked with Tombow brush pens a little bit before this trip, but this is really my first time deeply immersing myself into this material. One of my favorite inks to work with is walnut ink. Walnut ink has a beautiful, subtle brown color to it. It flows really well. But the thing is, if you consider what's involved, you gotta have all these brushes, you need a bucket of water, you need little tiny containers, so you have different gradients, you gotta bring the ink itself. It's just a lot to carry around. And so here, I just have dark brown, a color of thunder, and a medium brown, and that's it. That's all I need. And then I just have my blending palette. I also have my sketchbook. And so it's been really nice to only use one material and not have to think at all when I leave, oh, am I gonna use pencil today? Am I gonna use pen today? I just know coming on this trip that this is what I'm going to be using is these Tombow brush pens. And that's been really nice and easy. One thing that I love about these Tombow brush pens is that they're really juicy. They glide across the surface of the page beautifully. But actually, my favorite tool is this colorless blender. These are amazing. This is the equivalent of basically a wet brush that only has water in it. And so this is so wonderful because I can create very light gradients. I can blend, I can layer. I mean, the possibilities are really endless. They do get a little bit dirty after a while. You can see mine have these brown tips on the top, but I haven't found that to be an issue at all. I'm not somebody who's very picky about my tools being pristinely clean. That probably has something to do with it. But one thing I did discover is they do dry out if you use them very heavily. So what I started using was this little spray bottle that came with the Tombow blending palette. And what I just did is I just took this and I just put like a little spritz on top of these. 
And that honestly was enough to rehydrate them and they worked like magic after that. So I would definitely recommend with these brush pens, get a little spray bottle and just have this handy for when you wanna rehydrate your colorless blenders. About a week into my trip, I started noticing that because I was using my Tombow brush pens so much, pretty much all day, every day, they were totally dying. And I had a really dark brown one that was starting to get really, really dry and it just wasn't juicy and elegant the way it was when I first bought it. But actually, I started to discover when I was using the dead brush pen that I liked it. I liked how dry and light it was. It was such a totally different experience that what I started doing actually was carrying a crappy brush pen and a brand new brush pen because both of them make such totally different types of marks. And it reminded me so much of using India ink with a brush, using it with no water and using it with only the India ink. It's a totally different type of mark. And so that was a great way for me to replicate the contrast between dry brushing techniques and wet brushing techniques. Layering is definitely one of the most important techniques you can use with a Tombow brush pen. At first, when I started using the Tombow brush pens, I thought that layering was really only for different types of colors to blend on top of each other. I quickly discovered, though, doing those night drawings that even a color like black, which seems very opaque and it seems like, oh, I should just have to put one layer to be black, right? Uh-uh. You actually do have to layer the black brush pen at least three times before you get it to its fullest opacity. And same thing, even with a color like dark brown, I found I had to layer three or four times. And it was really fun because in one brush pen, you can get three or four different gradients just by layering it on top of itself. So layering is not just for putting, say, yellow on top of green. It's for putting brown over brown over brown. And that very much gives you many different layers of depth in the color. I have to admit, when I first got the Tombow blending palette, I thought it was a little silly. Then I started using it, and I'm totally eating my words now because I use it all the time. What I usually do is I'll take my darkest color, dark brown or something like that, and I'll color that on top of a blending palette so the blending palette holds the color right there. Then I'll take my colorless blender, dip my colorless blender into it to pick up some of that color, and then I can create really, really light gradients with the colorless blender. It's better than, say, using a brush pen that's just a lighter color because there's a lot more variation in the colorless blender. If I just use a light gray or something, the gradient of gray is almost too even and too perfect. And I like the colorless blender with the blending palette because it just has a little bit more warmth and a lot more variation in the strokes. One part of the Tombow brush pens that I love is that they feel so effortless to draw with. I've drawn a lot with charcoal and crayon in the past, and I love those two drawing media, but my goodness, they take a lot of work and a lot of exertion. Like your fingers actually hurt afterwards when you draw with charcoal or crayon. But with the Tombow brush pens, it's not like that at all. I feel when I'm drawing with one of these brush pens, it's almost like this beautiful dance across ice where you're just gliding and everything feels so smooth and silky and easy. The drawback to that is that they're so easy and so quick and easy to draw with that they're hard to control. So what I found very important when I'm drawing is just to have many different variations of speed. Sometimes I'll draw with them incredibly quickly and do a very fast staccato rhythm. Other times, I do it very slowly and very deliberately, especially when I want to make a very, very wide stroke that's very dramatic and bold and strong. I'll just really slow down my process a lot, and that gets me to exert a different kind of control over the brush pen. I learned really quickly that when you're traveling and drawing, so few things are under your control. And even when you think things are relatively stable, they really are not. There was one day in Taitung where my family had decided to go to the hot spring, and so I decided to stay behind and just take some time to myself and do a drawing. I was really excited about that because I knew I could finally take my time and not be rushed off to the next site. I sat outside of the B&B &B where we were staying, and across the road, there is this really beautiful scene of a very humble looking house, lots of trees, a ton of clutter on both sides of the house. And I thought, wow, this is perfect because it's right across from where I'm staying. I don't have to worry about staying here for too long. And it's such a stable scene. Nothing's really going to change. And I've got all this time to draw. 
And then I discovered that my family had gone to the hot spring taking my travel bag with them, which had all of my favorite brush pens in it. I had a stack of other brush pens in another bag, but those were like my reject brush pens. They were the brush pens that were really garish colors or they were all black. And I tend to not like the black brush pens as much because they're a little bit bluish and I tend to like brush pen drawings that are a little bit warmer in tone. So I was thinking to myself, great. <laughs> Finally, I had this opportunity to sit back and draw. I don't even have my brush pens. I thought, okay, well, maybe this is a chance for me to become better friends with my black brush pen. And then I think it was 30 minutes into the drawing that I realized, oh crap, it's starting to get dark. And so all of these details, which I had been articulating in the drawing, were just immersing themselves into darkness slowly as the day went along. And I thought, shoot. <laughs> The scene that I thought was going to be so stable is not so stable anymore. I was laughing at the whole situation because what I thought was going to be so stable and easy to do was anything but that. But in the end, I was actually really happy with the experience because it got me to do two drawings of night scenes, which ordinarily I would never have done on my own. And I also really got to know the black brush pens a lot better. And I guess what I learned from the black brush pens is that you actually really do have to pay attention to the direction of your marker strokes because doing these night scene drawings, there were lots of large areas of black brush pen. I thought, oh, well, I'll just fill it in. But the thing is, you could really see the strokes very clearly in the marker drawing. And so I thought, okay, well, I really have to work a little harder here. I got to blend the black on top of the black, which might seem ridiculous. But I think the Tombow brush pens, they're delicate enough that you really can see the strokes. And that was important for me to fix. So that was a great lesson that I learned from that drawing. It's funny, there's little things you don't realize are going to happen that actually make a big difference. For example, the first day we were drawing at this temple and I was wearing pants. And so I just thought, oh, well, I've got my Tombow brush pens here, so I'll just stick them in my pocket. And that was super convenient because I was able to go in and just whip them out when I was ready to use the next marker. And the next day, I didn't think this through. I was wearing a skirt that didn't have any pockets. And I thought, oh shoot, where am I gonna put my brush pens? This is a big pain. I'm really not an artist who draws on site all the time, but I do have a lot of experience with it. My junior year in art school, I spent nine months studying abroad in Rome, Italy, and I pretty much spent that entire period traveling all across Europe and drawing on site everywhere I could. It was a great experience, but one thing that was really challenging was these huge packs of tourists who would be making constant comments the whole time I was in public drawing. I know people are fascinated by the drawing process, and that's exactly why they stop and they ask you questions and they comment and everything. But honestly, when you're trying to really focus on your drawing and get something done, it's super distracting to have people constantly asking you questions the whole time. That's why when I made the decision to make this trip to Taiwan, I was really bracing myself for that, for going to sites and not being able to get anything done because so many people were bothering me. But to my pleasant surprise, I've gotten very few comments from people working on site. And for the most part, I've really been able to draw in complete solitude. It's been really lovely to be able to do that. I found this funny looking demon in this temple in Kaohsiung. A lot of the demons and gods that you see in these temples, they either look really nasty or they look like they're laughing hysterically. I love this demon because he just looked really nervous. He looks stressed out and anxious. And I thought, I got to draw this guy. He's just got the most priceless expression. And I really spent the whole time working on that drawing completely by myself. Every 30 minutes or so, somebody would come by and do a little bit of praying, but that was it. And so I'm grateful for these opportunities to experience these sites in life and yet really be able to completely focus on the drawing process. Sometimes you get into these sticky situations where you can't draw what you meant to draw. I went to this outdoor market, which was remarkable. There were so many vendors, and I remember I saw this one woman, she was holding two umbrellas, 
and she was sitting and she had all these baskets full of fruits and everything. She had a hat on. I was like, wow, you've got it made in terms of sun protection. So I sat down, I started doing this drawing of her in my sketchbook and literally like two minutes into the drawing, like I had barely sketched her umbrellas. This tofu vendor comes in and he parks his cart right in front of her, like totally blocked my view. I'm like, oh crap, what am I gonna do now? And I thought, I know what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna draw the tofu vendor. I looked at his tofu cart, which was just the most dilapidated thing I'd ever seen. It had all these components to it and it just looked really junky and worn down. And so he actually parked his cart and then walked away. And I thought, oh, he's just gonna leave it there for a while. Okay, I'm gonna draw this. And then literally two minutes later, he comes back, moves his cart. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm done now. And then I thought, oh, well now I can draw the fruit vendor. And so I went back and I finished the rest of this gesture drawing. So I just love little moments like that where you just have no control over the situation, but it, you really have to learn to deal with it and not get upset and just say, you know what, let's just draw the tofu vendor now because his cart is just as engaging as her two umbrellas and hat. I'm constantly talking to my students about the importance of drawing from life. I don't need to be convinced any further, obviously, but oddly enough, on this trip, I found another reason why drawing from life is so important. A lot of the sites that I drew at were in really stark contrast to each other. There was one evening where we went to the night market in Kaohsiung. It was the most loud, chaotic, crazy scene I have ever been a part of. Contrast that against this beautiful, quiet scene across the road from my B&B in Taitong, and things don't get more different than that. It was drawing at the night market that made me realize that the character of the scene influenced so much the way that I took my approach to the drawing. At the night market, which was utter chaos, probably 50,000 different light sources, tons and tons of people just packed into a very tiny space, everybody moving around. The night market was so packed and crazy that I really had difficulty seeing the subject that I was drawing. I found this wonderful little fried fish stand. They had the funniest crab sign, which was this cartoon crab. It had these blinking lights on it, half of which were broken. It had such a funny, quirky personality and then the chaos surrounding it just made it that much better. The thing is, the night market is so totally jam-packed with people that even though I was standing pretty close to the stand, pretty much 50% of the time, I couldn't see it because there were just all these people walking back and forth the whole time. And I remember I was sitting there, I was holding my Bristol board and I was doing this because I couldn't see the parts that I needed to see. And I noticed that because there was this almost frantic pace in the night market that I started to drop with a really frantic pace. And I started really being extremely spontaneous, throwing in marks, not caring, and working incredibly fast. I'm already somebody who draws at a pretty fast pace as it is. And so the fact that the scene got me to probably double my drawing pace is really quite remarkable. It wasn't just how crowded the night market was, it's also the sounds and the smells of the night market, all of which are really intense. There's vendors who are shouting at the top of their lungs, there's people yelling what they want to order, and the smells change pretty much every two feet that you walk. And so what I thought was really exciting is I felt like that energy really translated into the way that I drew that evening. By contrast, the scene across the street from my b, &B in Taitong was so quiet and still. And I think you can really see that in the way that I approached the drawing because the street did have traffic on it, but it was very little. Every now and then a scooter would go by, but that was pretty much it. The scene was absolutely still, nothing changed at all. And I knew that I had pretty much all morning to work. So I really took my time. I really thoughtfully considered every mark that I put down. And I know looking back on this piece that I had a very slow, thoughtful pace to the way that I put down my marks. And that was really lovely to work in such complete solitude and really be able to take my time. 
I love the idea that your environment really affects how you decide to draw. And that's been one of the most exciting things for me to observe in my drawing process on this trip. There's almost that quintessential generic view of the site, like where you see the whole palace, you see the entire temple, it's this incredible view of the entire city. And I find all of that breathtaking and amazing to take in. But the thing is, I find that when I go to these sites, what I'm much more interested in is the little tiny details that you would never know about if you didn't actually get to go there. It was really common to have gorgeous picturesque scenes of the landscape right next to an abandoned rusty bicycle or just random pieces of wood and tires and busted up old chairs and buckets of nothing lying around. And I was frequently really surprised by that because you, you wouldn't think that things that were so beautiful and so old and ruined could be just next door to each other, but that was very common. There was one place in southern Taiwan that we traveled to that had gorgeous, picturesque, breathtaking landscapes of mountains. And then beneath it, there'd be some beautiful, lovely, elegant mansion. Everything seemed so perfect. But then a foot away, there was somebody's workspace, which was anything but perfect. So you would think looking at that scene, well, we've got the mountains, we've got the mansion, we've got the workspace, you would think I'd want to draw the mountains, right? Actually, no, I wanted to draw the workspace because the workspace to me felt so authentic. It didn't seem like it was trying to be something or be manicured or perfect. It just was what it was. And I, I love the honesty of that scene. And so I sat down and had quite a bit of time to really sit down and draw that scene. And I found these cluttered scenes really difficult to do because I found that I needed to squint a lot I had to be extremely observant, much more observant than usual, because you really have to follow almost this series of abstract shapes that don't really make a lot of sense by themselves. And you really do have to draw the whole scene all at once. I can't just draw one rope or one chair or one tarp. I have to draw the way all of those things connect together. And that's what made a lot of those scenes a huge challenge, but also really exciting to work on. Scenes like that are really overwhelming to take in because you feel like there's too much to draw. You don't really know where to get started. I find the way to really tackle that is to jump around the page a lot. So if I throw down a mark that's supposed to be the side of a barrel, I'll immediately jump to the other side of the page, throw in a mark that's supposed to be a tarp, move to the top part of the page, throw in a mark that's supposed to be a little piece of foliage. So if you tackle everything a little bit at once, it all ends up coming together at the end, but you have to have a lot of patience because the drawing looks like utter chaos for a really long time. And so just don't expect anything that looks great for a long time because it, it really takes time for those connections to visually make sense, but it'll get there. You just have to give it time. And I also found that a final sweep of details just to add a little touch of articulation is also super helpful. It was the same situation in all of the cities that we visited. We were staying at this really nice, modern looking hotel and literally right across the street, there is this decrepit building. It seemed like it was abandoned. More than half of the windows were shattered and broken. There was a mess of pipes and wires that seemed like they were completely falling apart. Usually when I'm drawing on site, I try to find a scene that really emphasizes depth and space within the scene. I'll look for things like linear perspective if I'm drawing architecture, or if I'm drawing a landscape, I try to really emphasize the atmospheric perspective. But this exterior plane of the building was so flat and so different than what I usually choose to draw because it really did not show any depth or space. And yet I was so attracted to it because of how decrepit a lot of the surfaces were. I really enjoyed the way that the wires seemed like they were dissolving into the gritty, coarse texture of the brick. And the different patterns of the shattered windows were also quite beautiful. I think what's tough when you're drawing spaces that are packed with so many different things is it's really hard to stitch together all of those little pieces together so that they create something that looks fluid and cohesive. I think in those situations, negative space is your best friend. 
I think for a lot of people, if they were drawing the side of a building, their first instinct would probably be to outline the windows and then draw on the window panes. But I actually found that it's a lot easier and a lot faster to draw everything that's around the windows because that gets you to really see the connections between all the different parts. And it makes it a lot easier to make your drawing more cohesive looking. I found in this trip that it's not just about going to places and sitting down and drawing, it's also the downtime. I've actually been doing a lot of drawings of my family just when we're crashing at the hotel after a long day. I did a drawing of my dad and my daughter playing Go together. Basically, there's two kinds of drawings I can make. I can make a drawing that's really quick and spontaneous and very gestural. Sometimes I literally have five minutes to do it on the site. And those drawings, I don't even try to deal with tone. I really am just using this one medium brown marker for doing that. But if I'm sitting at my hotel and I'm drawing my daughter and my dad, then I really can use the full spectrum. I can use my colorless blender. I can use my dark brown, my medium brown. And that's when I can really fully develop the drawing a lot further. And I think the moment that I really realized that was we were at the National Palace Museum. It was this huge, grand, sweeping space. I have this blending palette from Tom Bow. And so this is really nice because what I can do is take my medium brown and I just do this. And that's a way for me just to get pigment from the marker onto the page. And then I take my colorless blender and I pick up just very, very lightly. So I started this drawing, which had the entire palace in the background. I sat down and I, I did the initial sketch. I got the whole thing planned out. And then I realized, oh shoot, we only have five more minutes to go. And I knew looking at the sketch that there was no way that I was gonna get even close to finishing. And so I thought, okay, I got five minutes, let's just do this. So instead, I did this sketch where I ended up just using very, very brief marks with the colorless blender just to get a few sections a little bit more mapped out. And then I just took the medium brown brush pen and I just did the quickest gesture I could do in that space. I think this drawing took me about three minutes to do because I was in such a rush. I was like, oh my God, we're leaving in a few minutes. I have to get going. And in some ways that pressure is a little bit stressful because you're like, I only have so much time to work on this. But the thing is, it's also good too because it really forces you to capture the spirit of the place as quickly as you possibly can. I mean, this place was just crawling with tourists from China. They were all over the place. And so I drew a whole bunch of them over here in the plaza. There was all this foliage in the background. So this was a pretty complex space that I was drawing, but I had a lot of fun trying to figure out how to get all of those various components to really work together into a single image. It's really important to make a decision about whether I'm gonna work in a sketchbook, which is a lot smaller, or whether I'm actually gonna to bother to take up my Bristol board paper, which is a lot bigger and a lot more involved. And what I realized is when I really impress for time, that's when I use the sketchbook. One time we sat down for lunch in Kaohsiung and there was this bicycle across the street and I knew it was a street cleaner's bicycle because it had all these brooms on the back attached to it. There were all these plastic bags and contraptions attached to it. And I thought, this is the most marvelous thing I've ever seen. I gotta capture this. But the thing is, the street cleaner was standing about a foot away, sweeping up the street. And I thought, oh my God, she's gonna get up and she's gonna pedal right away. I better draw really, really fast. So I sketched it out as quickly as I could. And sure enough, about a minute later, she had biked away. The nice thing about drawing inanimate objects is you don't have to worry about them getting up and going somewhere. On the other hand, you sometimes have to worry about them getting eaten. When we were in Sinchu City, we went to this dumpling restaurant, which was really famous for making xiaolongbao, which is these little tiny pork dumplings. After we had finished the meal, we still had a couple dumplings left. And so I thought, oh, well, I'm just sitting here. I might as well just whip out my sketchbook and draw some of these. And I think what's amazing about these dumplings is that the skin was so thin, but it was also really strong and durable. So they didn't fall apart when you tried to eat them. My dad actually said that they count the number of folds that are in the dumpling. So every single dumpling has the same fold. And also we saw them weighing the amount of pork that was in each dumpling. So they all weigh exactly the same amount. I love how small my sketchbook is because even in the most cramped environment, I can still manage to fit in some drawing. 
There was one time we went to this tiny hole-in-the-wall restaurant in this small town in southern Taiwan, and it had the most dilapidated kitchen I'd ever seen. And I was blown away that they could produce so many dishes that were so tasty and delicious so quickly in such a tiny little space, which didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason to the way it was organized. I took one look at that kitchen and I thought, wow, I gotta draw this. I didn't have a lot of time though, because we were trying to eat a meal. And so I ate as quickly as I possibly could, whipped out my sketchbook, started sketching furiously. And I just felt the whole time I was drawing the drawing that it was a total disaster because first of all, the kitchen itself had no organization to it whatsoever. And so in the end, my drawing just felt like a huge disaster of marks. Afterwards, my mother took the drawing and she showed it to a bunch of the people who were working in the kitchen and said, oh, my daughter just did this drawing of your kitchen. And the female chef, she looked at the drawing and she recognized herself because I had drawn her at the stove stir frying something. And I don't know what it was, if it was the place that I drew her in or if it was the gesture of her arm, but she recognized herself. And so she gave me this huge smile, gave me a big thumbs up and I thought, wow, that's awesome. One thing that I always tell my students in drawing class is I really want them to develop all of the different parts of the drawing at the same time. And that's a really tough lesson to learn because I think a lot of people are just really used to focusing on details because details are what dazzle people. You look at a drawing and people say, wow, the details were so good in that drawing. And so I understand the tendency to think that the details are what you should focus on, but that's not actually true. And what I see is that people will work one area for a really long time and totally neglect the rest of the drawing. This trip has really been a great reminder for me to always develop all the parts of the drawing at the same time because I'm never gonna know when I have to get up and leave. And the thing is, I could end up with potentially a lot of drawings where one little part is really finished and then nothing else is touched. And to me, that's just not very satisfying as a final result. So what I've tried to do in my approach in the drawings is that no matter where I am in the drawing, whether I'm into it 30 seconds, three minutes, 20 minutes, the drawing has a feeling of resolution within itself. So it may not be totally finished, but it definitely has been worked all over. The top, the bottom, the side has been done. For example, when we went to the top of the elephant trail, I seriously only had about five minutes there, but I love the atmosphere of the space. And it's a complex space because there's a path going through, there's all this luscious scenery around it. And yet what I tried to do was to capture the whole scene. No part of this drawing is remotely developed, has no sense of detail at all, but the drawing does capture the entire scene. My advice to you, if you're traveling and drawing, forget about details. Details are not gonna happen. And I think once you accept that and you really embrace the gesture and a more holistic quality to the entire drawing, I think you're gonna be a lot happier and I think you're gonna get better results. Sometimes you're at a site, you gotta get up and leave right away and it's very unsatisfying. I had drawn this incredible tree. In fact, my daughter's been calling them orangutan trees because they have these weird, hairy, dark orange branches that come down. I love this tree because it was so amazing, all of the different forms and the textures and surfaces. But the thing is, I was probably about four minutes into the drawing, we had to get up and leave. But I looked at the drawing and it just felt really unsatisfying because the drawing was really flat, didn't have any texture or surface. And so actually on the train on our way to Huanglian, I ended up just playing with the drawing with my brush pens. And I found that liberating because I was really working based on my memory of the image. And also it gave me a chance to just play with my brush pens and just make marks and really embrace the surface. I'm not somebody who really likes to do that. Most of the time, I really enjoy having a reference, something I can really interpret. But I think in this case, because I had such a vivid memory of what the texture was like, it actually worked out pretty well. Another option, I guess, would be to take a photograph of the tree and then finish the drawing from that. But for some reason, I just feel like that's really unsatisfying because you just don't get the same experience. The textures aren't as vivid. I felt like it was a better use of my time to just think about the experience of the tree and what it looked like, and then just to play around with my brush pens.
In my eyes, traveling is learning. Any opportunity I have to travel is a chance to learn something new about other people, about the world, about myself. On this trip to Taiwan, I've learned so much about Taiwanese history and culture, Tombow brush pens, more than I ever thought was possible about pork dumplings, but most of all, about my family. Mama, Papa's shooting you. I know. Can you please tie that back on? It looks like you're yelling at kids. Don't don't talk to them.